The Crescent Nebula, like most of the well-known deep sky objects, is also known by any other name, many other names. NGC 6888, Caldwell 27, and Sharpless 105 are some of the catalog numbers this nebula has. It's also known as the Eurosign Nebula because it has a resemblance, a resemblance to the Euro currency symbol. It's in prime observing position for Northern Hemisphere viewers in the late summer and early fall, with a declination of 38 degrees north. The nebula is 5,000 light years away and only has an apparent size of 18 by 12 arc minutes. Here's my image from fall 2021. Wait, where's the crescent? In most images, this nebula looks more like a brain. Like the names of most nebulae, the name comes from its appearance visually, not through imaging. With the camera, we can integrate multiple hours of light and capture details that our eyes can't hope to see in the at most one-tenth of a second integration our, eye, our retinas can manage. To me, it looks like a brain with a blue comb over. We've been spoiled by narrowband filters. In a broadband exposure like this one I did in 2019, the full outline of the nebula is much fainter, and the crescent, or even Euro sign, is a bit more visible. And this was even with 13 and a half hours of integration time with the ASI 294 MC Pro. The 2021 image is a narrowband image in HOO. That is, hydrogen alpha is in red, and oxygen 3 is in green and blue. This approximates the natural colors, as hydrogen alpha emissions are red, and oxygen-3 emissions are a teal color. You can easily see the flattened sphere of hydrogen that is surrounded by a thinner, more diffuse O3 shell, and in the background, there's a dimmer hydrogen alpha glow. Here are the hydrogen alpha and O3 masters. You can see the H-alpha shows a lot of texture, and the O3 has more wispy edges. Combined, they make for an image with a wonderful detail and color. This is actually one of my favorite images. The Crescent Nebula was discovered in 1792 by William Herschel. Herschel cataloged thousands of objects and actually produced three catalogs between 1786 and 1802. Later, his catalogs, along with discoveries from his sister Caroline and son John, were combined into the General Catalog of Nebulae and Clusters in 1864. Still later, in 1888, John Dreyer combined this general catalog with discoveries from other astronomers and produced the new general catalog, which is the source of the ubiquitous NGC numbers we still use today. While Herschel didn't create the new general catalog, his work is the basis for a large chunk of it. But enough about Herschel. Fascinating as he and his family are, back to the Crescent. Just what kind of nebula is it? Is it a planetary nebula? It's sort of vaguely spherical and fairly compact like most planetaries. Is it a supernova remnant? It turns out it's neither. To understand what it is, we need to travel back to 1867 and to French astronomers Charles Wolfe and Georges Rayet. They did spectroscopic analysis of three stars in Cygnus, though not the one in the Crescent and found them to be very different from most other stars. For our stories, what matters for the crescent is that they have very hot surface temperatures and very strong stellar winds. They're massive stars that are now fusing helium in their cores. The star responsible for the crescent, WR136, has a surface temperature of about 70,000 Kelvin. It's about 21 times more massive than our sun and five times larger. It's 600,000 times brighter. It's a good candidate for a supernova in a few hundred thousand years. Somewhere between 100,000 and 400,000 years ago, when WR136 was a red supergiant, it blew off a shell of material. That shell is expanding at about 80 kilometers per second. At some point, the star entered this new wolf Rayet phase, and the stellar wind became much faster at about 1,700 kilometers per second. Eventually, the faster stellar wind caught up with the slower-moving shell. 
The result is an obvious shell and two shock waves, one traveling out and one traveling in. The inward traveling one ends up heating up the stellar wind to temperatures that emit X-rays. The surface temperature of WR36, WR136 is so high that it emits a lot of ultraviolet light, and that UV light is what causes the shell of glass to glow, and that's what we see in our eyepieces and cameras. So it isn't a planetary nebula, though it seems to resemble one structurally in that it's a shell of gas blown off a star. The difference is that star is much more massive than the stars that generate planetary nebulae, and the star at the center isn't a white dwarf, but a very massive still-fusing star, though one near the end of its life. There is a lot more going on than is obvious in visible light. In this image from the Chandra X-ray Observatory, you can see there is a lot of X-ray activity. It looks like the area around WR136 is an amazingly unhealthy place to be. So if you want to see the crescent visually, you're going to need a very dark sky, and an O3 filter is recommended by most people. I've never seen it visually myself, so if you have, let us know in the comments the conditions you had and what equipment you used. I hope you enjoyed our dive into the Crescent Nebula. Until next time, clear skies.